Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. My name is Nick Gold. I'm Managing Director of Speakers Corner and also the incoming president of the International Association of Speaker Bureaus. Really appreciate you joining us for our, our inaugural webinar event. At this time, what we're looking to do is support our clients, share ideas, find solutions to problems. We understand the world is a crazy place and we're here to support in any way we can. I'd also like to thank Alex Mitchell um, who's, and his founders community for joining us. He's creating a great network of business leaders who are looking to lean on each other during these highly pressurized circumstances. So welcome also to, the, to this webinar. When we, when we set this up, we knew there was only one subject we wanted to talk about right now. We want to talk around mental health. Listen, it's, it's anxiety, it's at fever pitch. We, none of us know what's going on. We have health fears, we have business fears. We're now all thrust into remote working. We're all thrust into this area of being isolated. And we need to find ways and tools and tips in order to help us through this time. And this is what hopefully we can give you today. Um, this is the first of, of, of a program of webinars we're planning. So I hope you enjoy this one. I would say, please bear with us. This is our first live one. There might be technical glitches, but we will try and work it way through and make it as smooth and seamless as possible. Um, from our perspective, speakers call and listen, nothing will beat being in the room and that live experience and being able to hear the speakers face to face and network and everything like that. But we're in different times, we're in different circumstances. And the truth is we still need to communicate. We still need to connect and we still need to engage with, with each other. And what we're trying to do here is show you there are other ways. The webinar is a quick, it's a quick easy way to get something up and going where you can relate to people, you can hear people, and you can, get, you can share those ideas. So I hope you enjoy this. I hope you experience what, we can, what we've been experiencing through the use of these programs and maybe get something tremendous out of it. So a little bit of housekeeping about how it's gonna work. Each speaker is gonna speak for about 10, 12 minutes or so, and then, we, and then we'll have Q&A. We're gonna have Linda speaking first. She's gonna do her Q&A straight off the back and then Mark and Aaron are going to speak after that and then they're going to ha have Q&A at the end of the session in, in a panel type format. Um, you'll see hopefully at the bottom of your screens a little button which says Q&A which will allow you guys to um, uh, type in your questions and we'll, we'll select some and we'll answer them as we go through. Um, unfortunately Adrian Fernham couldn't join us today, he had to attend a rather urgent personal appointment um, but he, we pre-recorded um, his speech with him, which we will send out post this. So apologies about that. Um, but as we say, we're in strange times. Um, so let's get cracking enough for me. Um, delighted to introduce Dr. Linda Papadopoulos, one of my favorite psychologists and speakers. She was recently included in the top 20 therapists in London by the Evening Standard and was awarded the Madame Figaro Woman of the Year Award. She is the founder and director of the successful program in counseling psychology at the London Metropolitan University and has written several academic and self-help books. Over the past decade, Dr. Linda has become one of the most recognizable faces on British TV. She was part of the original Channel 4 team on the reality TV phenomenon Big Brother, and went on to host the Channel 5 shows Dr. Doctor and Double Cross. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Linda. Hi, hi there, um, it's lovely to be here. Thank you so much. Um, Linda, sorry, just to interrupt, apologies. Oh, could you see me? Ah, we've got you. Brilliant. <laughs> Okay. Um, no, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you're absolutely right. Really um, strange times. Um, and and I guess what I what I thought I'd speak about a little bit today is kind of why coronavirus presents a threat to our mental health, but then also kind of try and give a few tips on how to deal with that. So when we're looking at anxiety generally from a psychological perspective, we we tend to find that things that cause anxiety are things that are novel are things that are a threat or are things that bring up uncertainty. And of course, we know that coronavirus represents all of these things. It is novel. It's uh, unlike any virus that any of us have experienced in our lifetime. lifetime. Um, there is certainly a threat there and, and, and a threat, I guess, on many levels, right? So it you know, goes without saying that this isn't just about you know, a threat to one's you know, mortality and one's health, but it's a threat to one's businesses, it's a threat to one's relationships, it's a threat to one's mental health. And then finally, and really importantly, it's the uncertainty angle. And I think this more than anything uh, gets us psychologically. I think human beings um, rely very much on a sense of volition, a sense of control, a sense of certainty to feel balanced. And with any illness, one of the biggest challenges is dealing with, with a sense of uncertainty. And I think with coronavirus, to a great extent, because we don't know much about it, that's sort of ever present. So again, if we kind of break down anxiety, I always think about it like this. It's the feeling that something's going to happen and I don't have the resources to cope with that. So it's a differential between what I think 
the resources I have inside me are, and what I'm anticipating happening. And if there's there's a disconnect with that, that's what becomes exceedingly problematic. Um, so I, I think what I, I wanted to speak about today are some of the things that maybe we can do to try and sort of mitigate some of the effects. Now, I've worked clinically for years, and when people come to see me, one of the first things I ask is, are you getting the basics right? And by that, I mean things like eating, sleeping, and moving. Now, this sounds really simplistic, but actually, at a time when we're self-isolating, when we're at home, where all of our day-to-day -day routine is disrupted, having any sort of semblance of a routine is going to be key. Um, in recent years, we've recognized the importance of nutrition on mental health in a way that we've never recognized before. And so while the temptation is going to be around eating junk or eating at different times or eating really late, it's imperative that that kind of really basic thing of eating healthy meals three times a day, you know, it's something tangible to hold on to and will make a big difference. Likewise with sleep, um, again, for years I remember when I was training, it was one of the things that you would ask if someone came to see you with low mood, you'd ask how they were sleeping. But, you know, the assumption being that um, sleeplessness was caused by depression. Now we know that insomnia or sleepless nights actually feed into depression, feed into low mood themselves. So ensuring that you're able to wake up at a similar time every day, to go to bed at a similar time, again, really important. And again, it's gonna be a challenge, right? There's a lot of people now that the routine's out the window, they're mindlessly watching TV, they're mindlessly scrolling news channels, the anxiety's high. So being able to get that under control is key. And then finally, moving, exercise. I mean, there's, there's study after study that attests to this. It's imperative to, to, to maintain good physical health for mental health. And a lot of people, again, will find this difficult because of all the changes that have been made, but you almost need to kind of diarize this the way that you would anything else into your day. The other thing that I think is really important is the language that we use. Um, I really dislike the term social isolation. Um, we live in a more socially connected time than literally ever before in history. There is absolutely no need to socially isolate. We need to physically isolate. Um, but in terms of connection, I think right now it's more important forever. And I need this on both a personal and a professional level. So in, in terms of, of what's going on in our day to day with, with our friends and our family, being able to, to connect online. There's a huge amounts of technology. My mom lives in Cyprus. She was teaching me um, how to cook um, Greek pasticho the other day on my little video in my kitchen when she was over there. So, you know, it's not just about stopping and talking. It's about how do we do this creatively? My daughter showed me that you can watch Netflix with friends and, and you can pause at the same point and comment on it. You know, we, we have amazing tech now. We've got house party where a bunch of people can speak at the same time. And these things used to be little fun add-ons. I think at a time when we're having to kind of physically isolate, it's really important we use that kind of tech um, effectively to be able to, to do that. I think the, the other thing in terms of kind of connecting as well is to ensure that, you know, that we don't kind of get into that rhythm of, of our world becoming smaller and smaller. Again, one of the big things that anxiety does is it makes your world smaller, right? So, you know, you begin to feel anxious about something, so you avoid it. And of course, the more you avoid, the more anxious you feel. So it may very well, you know, be now that, you know, we're told not to do one thing, we're told not to do another, so our worlds become tighter, they become smaller. Being able to push back on this is, is going to be imperative. The third thing I wanted to speak about um, is this idea of control. It's, you know, it's, it's something that everyone's, you know, touching on. We feel out of control. We're, we're told every day that the worst case scenario is happening. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, we're living at a time where we, we, we couldn't possibly consume all the news out there. You know, we, we have more news than any human being could ever kind of take the time to, to assimilate either um, emotionally or cognitively. So we're in this really difficult situation where it's constantly coming at us. And it's bad news and we don't feel we, we can do anything. And I think with this, one of the things that's, you know, that, that we can do is separate the stuff that we can control from the stuff that we can't. And there's a couple of ways of doing this. I think it's really important to think about how we curate our consciousness, right? You could literally read horror stories 24-7. 
And while, of course, you want to have a realistic view of what's going on and getting your news, I think there's something really important about having some barriers to, you know, having some limitations on how much you consume, when you consume, and how you consume. So it may be that we, you know, have a decision as a family to ensure that you sit down and you consume most of your, you know, you read the news in the day, you sit down and you watch the news at six o'clock or you, you know, you check your phone for news maybe on three occasions, but there needs to be a limit. And interspersed within that, it's vital that your consciousness is allowed to kind of drift elsewhere, right? That you're reading, uh, you know, a good news story, that you're reading a novel, that you're speaking to someone who is not just going to heighten your anxiety. Because the fact of the matter is, I think now more than ever, we need to be conscious of kind of keeping that that sort of emotional five a day, sort of in, in the UK, we had this big thing of eating five vegetables and fruits a day. I think psychologically, you need an emotional five a day. And what does that mean? That means something that gives you a sense of purpose, something that gives you a sense of connection, something that relaxes you, something that allows you to escape and something positive, right? So there's something very key about ensuring how we not only seek out information, but how we speak about it with others, and how we allowed our, you know, allow ourselves to think about it. Um, and, and I think, you know, again, this is going to be important for a lot of sort of business people out there as well who are trying to keep their businesses going. And this is kind of one of those stories that is going to get in the way everywhere. So speaking about boundaries, right? When you are kind of, you know, with everything to do with work, with what your expectations are from your employees, to if, you're, if you are an employee, what you're, you know, what you, you want your employers to know in terms of what those anxieties are, having space to speak about them, but then also sort of coronavirus free spaces where you can speak about other things that, um, that allow you to, to kind of escape, to move on. Um, and I think finally, um, I think what, what's really important to sort of look at is, is this idea of, you know, in many ways, this is, you know, someone was saying the other day, are you sick of listening to Brexit more or this more? I think Brexit was divisive, but I think, you know, I kind of prefer listening to Corona stuff because at least it connects us, right? Potentially, this is one of those things that's going to bring us together because by protecting you know, ourselves, we are protecting each other. And I think we just need to be on top of the language that we use. We can use the language of loss, right? We can use the language of losing freedoms and, you know, having to stay inside, or we can lose the language of positivity around what we are doing to give back and how, how this will feel when we come out of it. So I think it's, it's really important to try very hard to, to be aware of how we speak to ourselves. I always say to the people that, that I work with that, you know, no one speaks to you as much as you speak to yourself. So kind of being aware of that sort of critical voice, that fearful voice in your head and being able to push back on it is, is going to be key. So those are my main points. Um, I thought I'd kind of open up the, the space now to some Q&A because I often find that those are kind of where a lot of the, the interesting things come up. So I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to, to you. Thank you so much indeed, Linda. Really, really appreciate it. Fascinating stuff. So thank you so much, everyone, for the questions. Um, so we've had a couple of people asking, how do you cope with the thoughts that this is going to go on for an indefinite amount of time? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think what you need to look at is what do I know that's certain? What do I know that's uncertain? So here, you know, we know that this will at some point end. We don't know when, but we do know that it will. So I think kind of having the background that I need to prepare for when this ends, what I will do, but also I need to be in the here and now. There's something really important about being in the present. So what can I manage today? Today I need to, to manage a few things so I can keep myself safe with all the hand washing, the social distancing, but also there's something about the here and now in, about what I can control in terms of how I'm living my life, right? What did I do today to give me a sense of purpose? What did I do today to give me a sense of connection? And those two little things that you can control will actually stand you in much better stead in terms of the overall sense of uncertainty certainty but also when things do come to an end and they will you're probably going to be in a much better place to kind of face that as well i've had a, i've had a few people just asking to, for you to go through the five a day again please um. <laughs> okay so i think we need to do something every day that gives us a sense of purpose, right? So, and sometimes it's big, sometimes it's small. Sometimes it's like, you know, I'm going to cook a, a healthy meal for my kids today, or I'm going to call an, an elderly neighbor and make sure they're okay. 
Secondly, a sense of connection. So being able to feel like I've had a meaningful connection. I think, you know, again, it's a paradox of such a connected age that so many of us feel disconnected. So ensuring that there is a meaningful connection. And sometimes it's sending a cat meme, but sometimes it's a, it's a deeper discussion. So ensuring that you do that. Thirdly, to ensure that you've engaged in some self-care skills. Have I looked at something that gives me a sense of, you know, I, I've done this for me. So whether it's, you know, I've taken time to, to work out, I've taken time to speak to a friend about a worry. Um, I think we also, it's really important with our emotional five a day to kind of check in with ourselves. So what are we doing? How are we kind of self-reflecting around that? Have I checked in today? Have I kind of taken my temperature? And again, that can take the form of just standing still, looking at what's causing anxiety, what's not. And I think finally, and really importantly, it's kind of that emotional five day of being in the present, sort of stopping. And whether you do that through mindfulness or whether you do that through reading your favorite book, but that idea of kind of these, you know, these 10 minutes are mine and mine alone. So two, two uh, I've had a strand of questions also around anxiety. Um, some people have asked on behalf of how they deal with their employees who are potentially suffering from anxiety over coronavirus and it's becoming all consuming. And some other people have talked about it for themselves, how they, how they should better deal with the stress and the anxiety yeah. which corona is, is generating. So here's the interesting thing with um, anxiety. It's, it's the difference between reacting to possibility and probability. Is it possible that you're going to uh, get a corona and be terribly sick and possibly die of it? It's possible. Is it probable? Actually, it's very improbable unless you are in that, and even for those people in that very small bracket, right? So over sort of a very, very high age, you know, most people tend to be quite high, in fact, over 80, a lot of them with underlying health conditions. Um, and, and again, you know, in that bracket themselves, and again, I was reading a really interesting article from an epidemiologist, we don't, we're not actually sure if they're dying just of corona or of corona and everything else, right? So actually, again, and our brains aren't great at kind of, you know, working through possibility and probability when we're anxious, right? But that's precisely what underlies anxiety. It's the fact that we overestimate the threat. So I feel like I'm going to die of corona. It doesn't mean I will die of corona. Now, there's a couple of things that you can do. I think number one is to, is to kind of almost pedantically say that to yourself. Like, what are the odds in my age group? You know, what's happening? What are the odds? So I may get it, but in terms of dying, you know, it's, it's very unlikely. Secondly, what can I do to protect myself? Well, there is a lot we can do. We know that it will make a huge difference. And we've seen this in South Korea, we've seen it in Japan, we've seen it in Taiwan. If we socially distance, if we keep to the hand cleaning, if we make sure we stay away from each other for a little while, we know we're going to contain this, right? So focus on the things that you can do and ensure that when those thoughts come in, you kind of Give yourself that mantra of possibility, possibility, but then move your thoughts on. I think those are the two cognitive tools when you're dealing with anxiety. Number one is challenging the thought, and number two is pushing back and then distracting, right? So I'm going to challenge the thought. I'm going to, and if you have to write it down, I think that's often a wonderful tool. Here are the reasons why this is an, you know, an exaggerated thought. And now I'm going to watch, you know, my favorite episode of Friends. Or now I'm going to go and work on that spreadsheet. Or now I'm going to go throw a ball around with my kids. So I'm going to look at the thought. I'm going to acknowledge it. I'm going to push back on it. And then I'm going to shift. Last question. Thank you so much indeed. And I think kind of we focused on the individuals. And a question's come up which says, as an organization, we're trying to engage our employees by sharing information on staying active, focus on the present, avenues to learn informal contact informal connects what else we can we be looking at as employers to keep our employees engaged and productive and um treat them right i suppose right now yeah i think i think there's a sense that they need to feel like they're cared about right i think in times like this um, I think we're going to remember the people that showed up and the people that didn't. And that's true of organizations as well, right? So how are you showing up? So, you know, I think absolutely it's wonderful that you're giving that information, that you're giving advice. I would also say use technology just to connect the way that you might have a team building thing down, you know, um, down at the pub or having a drink together. It may be like, hey, guys. You know, we're going to be online on House Party for, you know, 45 minutes on Friday if you want to join in just so we can all see how we're doing. Because what you want to do is you want to establish a new normal, right? This, our, our normal has been disrupted. Again, 
you know, human beings need routine. Human beings need ritual. We're really good at that. And the more we get it in place, the sooner it is. So we've spoken about the importance of routine and ritual with waking up at a certain time and eating at a certain time and all of those things. But you can do it in the workplace as well. So if you kind of help them feel valued in terms of kind of that social aspect that may be missing, which is what people I think in many ways are going to miss most from the workplaces, the better. Dr. Linda, thank you so much indeed for your time. It's been a privilege to listen to you and I'm, I'm sure all our attendees by the amount of questions have thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks, thank guys. Lovely to speak. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, to Dr. Linda. We're delighted to now introduce Mark Hennick. Mark is currently the National Director of Strategic Initiatives for the Canadian Mental Health Association and a senior member of the Board of Directors of the Mental Health Commission in Canada. Mark's TEDx talk, Why We Choose Suicide, is among the most watched in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Hennick. Thanks so much, Nick, for having me uh, uh, and giving me the opportunity to speak with your audience today. It's a real privilege for me as a Canadian uh, to be able to reach across the pond uh, and be able to work with organizations and individuals in audiences all over the world. I've had the great privilege of doing this uh, for, for more than a decade now, actually, um, communicating the importance of mental health from a very personal perspective. So as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk to your folks about uh, today, um, I considered what some of the other speakers would be offering and the, the really valuable uh, clinical and practical insights that they're offering. I'm hoping to take a little bit different of an angle, although I've done uh, the, the corporate workshop, uh, corporate mental health workshop uh, thing for a long time now. Uh, I think for me, it's all based in personal experience. And I think we can learn a lot from the personal experiences of people who have been there, both in terms of breaking down stigma uh, that prevents help-seeking behaviors. We know that if we can just get people into the help that they need and that they deserve to have, that more often than not, the help actually does work. The problem is that people aren't getting access to the help. And part of that is the stigma barrier that's preventing them from speaking up. So we know from research, for example, here in Canada at uh, Queen's University, uh, some really wonderful research happening at King's College London as well, uh, that one of the most effective ways to break down the stigma that prevents people from reaching out for help is something called contact-based education. Uh, talking to people who have been there, uh, who are able to share their story uh, about what worked for them, but also what didn't. Uh, what did people say to them that maybe made them, made them retreat more? If they're anxious and terrified that this is such a difficult time, such an unusual time, which of course it is for everybody, uh, how can we actually invite meaningful, helpful conversations uh, when people maybe are at risk or are struggling more than, uh, more than some others? So when I think about my broad range of experiences, I think that I wanted to showcase for you today, uh, both as a speaker and a, as a workplace mental health education consultant, um, I really wanted to be able to, to zoom in on, on some of these personal pieces. Uh, however, my goal in doing this is very specific. Um, what I've learned, uh, both as a, in my personal life and my professional life, is that people want to talk about their mental health no matter what the circumstance is, even in as unusual uh, an environment as we are presently in, people want to talk about how they're feeling. They want to talk about how hard it is. And in fact, on my social platforms over the last two weeks or so, I've noticed that many people who had had prior experience with mental health problems and illnesses or pre-existing mental illnesses uh, are starting to say that this time has actually been good for their mental health in some ways, that they feel more connected, uh, not only with those around them, but with the entire world, that the type of social cohesion that's starting to develop as a result of the social isolation, ironically, uh, is that it's actually improving their mental health in some ways, that we're finding ways to connect with people that we had lost. So in an environment where sometimes we have no other choice but to look for the silver lining, uh, we're starting to see some really beautiful, hopeful stories come out of that. And that really connects with me, I think, because that's what I, uh, that's what I was seeking uh, as a young person uh, growing up with a mental illness. Now, I didn't know that at the time uh, when I was uh, 12 years old thinking about suicide uh, because partly of my brain and the way that my brain works, I had later been diagnosed with depression and anxiety. Uh, but at the time, I thought I was just a, a strange kid that nobody knew what this felt like. Nobody knew what this was like. And I felt like I couldn't tell anybody. 
I felt that isolation every single day. You know, it's some of, some of us introverts and people who had been depressed and anxious for a very long time, uh, when the social isolation started, welcomed everybody else to the party. Well, this is what it's like for us every day. This is strange for you, but this is what it's like. Um, so I think that part of that has been community building. Now, you know, in my keynotes, I, I walk through and I, I functionally analyze and process and draw the messages out of my entire struggle, but only with 10 minutes here with you today. I'll give you the Coles Notes version uh, of what I was able to learn from that struggle. Because again, what else can you do with your struggle but learn from it? It can conquer you. You can, you can allow the waves to wash over you or you can do something with it, uh, which is ultimately what I've chosen to do throughout my entire 20-year career in doing this so far. Um, so for me, I think it culminated in a moment that, uh, for those of you who have seen uh, the TED Talk that Nick uh, generously mentioned, uh, for me, it came on the edge of a bridge. I had become what's un unaffectionately known as a frequent flyer of the mental health system. I'd been in and out of hospital so many times with suicide attempts, with depression and anxiety, with conflict at home and so many other issues, until eventually I felt like I just couldn't do it anymore. And I needed to escape the isolation uh, that was around me all the time, in my own mind, uh, largely. You know, that I had internalized the social stigma that was around me, and that I felt like I couldn't break out of my own mind. Uh, as many of you may feel now, staying home uh, and unable to leave. That's how I felt all the time. So I had climbed over the railing of a bridge in my hometown at about midnight, fully intending to die, uh, until somebody stopped their car. I don't know how long I was there, but somebody stopped their car on the bridge. He got out. Many other people had driven by, but this guy stopped, a complete stranger. He approached me at the railing, and he talked to me. And he talked to me, I grew up in a small town, a small steel, well, formerly steel making town, although by the time I was growing up, all the steel plants and coal mining had closed uh, and everybody had lost their jobs. Uh, but he uh, stopped and he walked up to me and he talked to me just like he would talk to anybody else on the side of a, a street uh, uh, in a small town, except I was on the wrong side of a railing, railing of a bridge at 15 years old, about 40 feet above the ground, ready to die. Why I'm telling you this story, why I'm telling you about that stranger in this present circumstance for your work uh, in, in uh, corporate environments and encouraging others to speak out uh, is not simply for the sake of, of telling you an, uh, a shocking story, but rather what interested me was what that stranger did when he approached me in that very unusual circumstance of a kid on the wrong side of a railing uh, of a bridge. He didn't suddenly run up and grab me. He didn't pull me off the bridge. He didn't invalidate my experience at that time and how hard it was for me. And he also didn't, what I call, slide into fixer fixation. He didn't try to tell me that everything would be okay because he didn't know. He didn't know me or my life. He didn't know what I'd been through before. I hear this from managers and people working in human resources and occupational health and safety all the time. How do you help somebody if you don't know really anything about them, if you only have a very brief moment uh, to try to figure out what their issue is and then to move on? But what he did do was ask me questions. He asked me about my life, about the people that I cared about. He asked me what I did with my day, what my hobbies were, with my, what my uh, favorite subjects were in school. He asked me about the things that I was interested in. And to me, that seemed so unusual because I felt like everybody had been so hyper-focused at that point of being such a frequent flyer of the mental health system on my problems uh, that they never actually took the time to get to know who I was as a person and what I was interested in and what motivated me. He kept me on the railing uh, or on the edge of that railing for long enough that eventually the police had arrived. Uh, and I, I noticed when I started to zoom out of the dissociation that I was in in that place, because when you're in a mental health crisis, everything collapses in on itself. You start to, everything else starts to fade away because that's our survival mode in the moment of the trauma. So when I zoomed out of that a little bit, I realized that the police had barricaded the bridge and that crowds had gathered, uh, even though it was midnight because I lived in a small town and people used to listen to the chatter on the police scanner to see if there's any interesting action happening at night. And crowds had gathered at the barricades and a group of young men, I remember hearing as I was standing on about an inch and a half of concrete, one of the young men shouted out to me for me to jump. And he called me a coward. And in that moment, I was struck 
by the dichotomy of these two strangers. One man who decided to just who decided to pull over, even though he was scared, and talk to me, even though he didn't know what to say, even though he clearly wasn't a therapist or a mental health professional of any kind, just to stop and talk to me like a normal person. And this other person who chose to stand on the sidelines and to, to drive disconnection, no matter how much it hurt somebody else. When he said that, I let go of the railing and I started to fall. But since I had this other guy right at my back, who I, who I never even remembered his name after that, uh, he reached out and he grabbed me. And then somebody else who I had never even known was standing behind me grabbed me too. And they pulled me backward over the railing and put me in the ambulance. Although that was my uh, seventh time uh, being admitted to the psychiatric ward for a mental health crisis, it was actually my last. And two days later, uh, following my discharge that time, uh, it was the first day of spring. That stood out to me for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I had the opportunity uh, to decide who I was when I left the psychiatric ward that time. I was burned into my mind, this image of these two people, the one who chose to stand at the sidelines and the one that ch who chose to have my back. And I decided in that moment that I got to choose which of those two guys I could be like when I left here. Now, when I did that, I don't want to be Pollyannish with you. It wasn't like suddenly, hallelujah, all of my life was better and all of my problems went away. For those of you who are tasked with helping people in your workplace, you'll know that that's not how solutions work. That's not how recovery works. Recovery is strange and, and circuitous often. But it was that one degree shift that let me know that there was somebody else out there who cared and that maybe I could be like that person too who reached out to others. That's what started to break down the silence for me. And that's what started to make things move for me and give me the passion and purpose to move on. So it wasn't until many years later that I did this TED Talk and it went viral all over the world uh, that I realized that I had no idea who this stranger was who saved my life. I decided I needed to find him and I'd been doing media work by that point. I, I've now done more than a, 150 del television and uh, radio segments on mental health uh, advocating for people to speak up just like I just did because it's, it's fine to have these wonderful grand theories and clinical theories about how we should ask people if they need help and reach out to them. I think it's more impactful to actually show people what that looks like uh, through our actions by walking the walk in addition to talking the talk. So I decided I need to find this stranger, I went on television and asked for the public's help. This, thing go, this story goes viral all over the world. It gets picked up by the Independent there in the UK. Uh, and suddenly me, uh, I've got the whole world <laughs> at my back trying to find this stranger. And within an hour, I start getting flooded with messages on social media of people who said they knew who I was talking about. In fact, I got an email from, uh, or a Twitter message rather, uh, from somebody who said he was his roommate at the time that the stranger had seen the TED talk in which I talk about him, the stranger who saved my life uh, on a bridge late one night, uh, and that he had seen it a week earlier and started to write me a letter in case someday he ever found me. The stranger didn't know if I had actually lived after he left me there that night. They asked if they could send me the letter. I agreed and he did. And in his very first words, he said, hi, Mark, my name is Mike. When Mike introduced himself, I think that moment of validation for me uh, had proven uh, that what I had been doing for the last more than 13 years by that point since, because of him, uh, mattered, that it was real, and that that one little action that only took place, uh, that simple conversation that had only took place over the course of about 10 minutes, I later learned, changed everything for me. He not only saved my life in that moment, but he actually changed my life uh, ever since. So why I'm telling you that is because I think it's important to be able to break down what Mike did, the simple action. Sometimes we overcomplicate what it means to reach into the isolation and help people. It's actually very simple. He stopped. Lots of other people drove by on the bridge that night, but Mike, for whatever reason, stopped. And part of that was because he was present. He was paying attention to the people around him. It's so easy just to coast through life disconnected from everything that's happening around us, but Mike was paying attention. Or even if it was an accident, he didn't ignore the accident of the emotional feedback of people that he was getting around him. He stopped. He approached me. If other people did see me, I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll probably never know uh, if they just kept driving. 
I think it's important that if we see the signs of something, many times we want to ignore them, especially if it's somebody we love, especially if it's somebody that we work closely with every day. No, that won't happen to them. It's not that bad. We try to diminish it, I think, for our own mental health, for our own safety. But we have to approach. And then he engaged me. He met me where I was, a kid on the edge of a bridge, sure, and that was scary, yes. But he wasn't a therapist and he didn't pretend to be one. He didn't pretend to have all the answers. But what he did that was so impactful for me when he approached me and then engaged me on the edge of the bridge that night was that he just connected. He just talked to me and met me where I was. And even if he didn't know what to do to help me, he was willing to have my back enough to help me find somebody who could. And I think that's what we need to be able to do in workplaces across the UK and Canada and all over the world. We don't have to be fearful that we're not a therapist and we can't help this person who might be struggling. We have to be brave to be able to reach out, to walk the walk, to show people that it's okay to express how you're feeling and to talk about how you're feeling, uh, even when it's really hard and scary. And that if I don't know how to help you, I'll help you find somebody who can. That kind of community building as a person with a mental illness, that kind of connection building was by far what happened, what, what helped me the most, knowing that somebody was on my team. And I think that's why I've seen uh, in my social networks and elsewhere, uh, people saying that this time of crisis, this very unusual time of coronavirus, uh, has actually been good for them. They've actually found it uh, to be better for building connection. So I would encourage everybody here listening to this to use this as an opportunity. Use this, this uh, trauma that we're all collectively going through as a way to steal ourselves and to build some skills that we'll use after this passes. Because if there's one thing that I consistently remind myself almost every day, especially these days, it's that this too shall pass. This shall pass. And we're all in it together. So I hope that this has been helpful for you. And I hope that as soon as you uh, uh, leave this webinar today, or maybe even while you're passively uh, observing it, that you reach out to somebody. Send somebody a text message. Give somebody a call. Uh, reach out. Just check in. See how they're doing. And be willing to listen. Thank you all so much. Mark, thank you so much indeed for that. Um, as I said at the top, Mark and Aaron are going to take questions at the end, so please feel free to keep sending in the questions. If you can't find it, I think the Q&A button is down the bottom of the page. So Mark will be rejoining us again in a bit. Um, lastly, delighted to introduce Dr. Aaron Barak. He's a psychotherapist, cultural therapist and author, applying ideas from psychology to culture and technology. He's an honorary senior lecturer at the Department for Psychosocial and Psychoanalytical Studies at the University of Essex. His books include The Psychodynamics of Social Networking, Connected Up Instantaneous Culture, and the Self and the Illustrated Children's Self-Help Book, Keep Your Cool, How to Deal with Life's Worries and Stress. And most recently, The Little Book of Calm, Tame Your Anxieties, Face Your Fears and Live Free. Aaron is the director of Still Point Spaces, an international psychology, co-working, therapy and events hub based in London. Aaron. Great. Thanks very much, Nick. I appreciate that. And big thanks for Mark, too. I think what, what Mark is doing and sharing his experience vulnerably is really important because I think a lot of us are suffering inside with anxiety or vulnerability or suicidal thoughts or whatever it was might be and we often feel like the only ones doing that so to have people out there expressing their experiences openly is um, really helpful for everyone and it's a it's a really important take home too for um, everyone listening today um, can you find some space in your lives to be authentic and open and um, share your fears uh, not just with your therapist but also possibly with your with your co-workers um, we're all kind of in this thing together before I kind of go into what I sort of prepared to talk to you about, I want us to like stop just for a second um, and in a sense, catch up with ourselves. If you're anything like me, if your experience is anything like mine, the past two weeks, three weeks has been a little bit crazy. We've had like enormous global social change and most of us haven't caught up with ourselves about it. And I understand this through my own clinical practice where people come to see me and it's like, okay, let, let's just take a breather. Let's find out where you are. When massive changes like this happen, um, often people go into what is called a manic defense, which is kind of like this super hyper uh, doing everything you need to do to control a situation or to prepare or whatever it is. And the example that I like to give is, um, you know, if you've ever 
written up an exam in your life. It's, you know, when, when you need to hoover, hoover the house before you start finishing your essay or before you start studying, sort of the, this, this doing to get away from the thing that's scaring you. So in order to help us catch up, and this is a little bit unusual in a webinar, is I do want to ask everybody who's watching to come to themselves, to look at me, and we're just going to take a couple of deep breaths together. Yeah, it's what, almost half past three UK time. You've probably been in front of your computer all day or in front of a screen all day. You've probably been frenetically going all over the place all day like me. You've heard two of us speak already. You're going to hear me. So let's just catch up with ourselves. And it really helps as a grounding exercise to take a big, long, deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. So I'm going to do one and hopefully you can do one with me. Just a really long one right into the stomach. And when you do the exhale, nice and slowly, I also want you to feel your feet on the floor. So if you're sitting at your desk or anywhere, uncross your legs, put both of your feet on the floor, and we just want to ground a little bit. We're just going to do this two more times so we kind of just come into our bodies and into ourselves so that we're attentive and present for the next 10 minutes of the talk. So here we go again. I know it's a little bit weird, but it's bear with me. <laughs> okay, in through the nose. Right down, breathing into the stomach. And a long slow exhale out through the mouth and I'm going to let you do the, do the next one in your own time and I just want you to reflect a little bit on what that experience was like for you you know often in a clinical se session we will say what was your level of anxiety before you did this exercise? And they might say it was a seven or an eight. And then sometimes you do these breathing exercises, you ground yourself into the floor and it kind of can drop to a four or a three. For some people, it makes them more anxious because it gives them some space to think when they're trying to fill their consciousness with distraction to stop being anxious. But actually in some ways, that second kind of anxiety is better for you because it's a more direct relationship to what's going on. And what I'm going to be talking about today is let's talk about having only the anxiety and fear that is absolutely necessary and no more than that. Okay. Only the anxiety and fear that is absolutely necessary and no more than that. We are allowed to be a little bit afraid, a little bit worried, and a little bit concerned about what's going on. It would be too much of an ask to say we must be feeling completely calm and settled about this. But we also don't need to worry more than we ought to. Okay, so I'm just going to break this up into two different things. So I'm going to talk about the challenges that coronavirus offers us and then some of the solutions about how we deal with these challenges. Um, Dr. Papadopoulos talked a little bit about this, that actually there's something about this virus that does not just um, attack certain receptors in our cells, but it attacks certain psychological and emotional things that make us feel secure in our lives. She mentioned this thing about uncertainty, which is a big one for us. But if you think about any normal human being's main concerns in everyday life, when we're not in a situation like this, what will they say? They're concerned about their financial security, they're secure, they're concerned about their health, and they're concerned about uh, the health of their loved ones. And here we are in a challenge that challenges all of these things. Thrown on top of that, all of our rituals and orders have been completely thrown out in the past two weeks. So we're, we are not commuting to work and being at work and coming home or at home, some of us in better situations than others. So all of the normal ways in which we would deal with these kinds of anxieties have been turned upside down too. So how do we create an environment in which we can hold these anxieties in the most reasonable way as possible without overdoing it, but without expecting too much of ourselves? So it's quite a lot. Yeah, we're not, we're not all Zen monks. We can't just accept everything that comes along as if it's nothing. It's fine to be afraid, just not too afraid. So what kind of solutions should we be thinking about? Uh, Dr. Linda also mentioned this, which I'm going to expand upon a little bit, which is what actually makes anxiety, right? And it's this thing about um, ideas about something that's going to happen and whether we can manage it or not. And there's a little uh, equation in psychological maths that I like to use that describes this pretty well. And we say anxiety is the overestimation of harm multiplied your underestimation of your capacity to cope with that harm. I'll just say that one more time. Your overestimation of how bad things are going to be multiplied by your underestimation of how well you can cope with it. And I have seen this a hundred thousand times because I have been working clinically for 20 years. Uh, 
the anxiety that we anticipate about things that are going to happen is never as bad as the thing that happens. Because actually, when the thing happens, we find that we have the coping skills to meet with the challenge. We're less anxious because we're dealing with the challenge. Now, that doesn't mean that that challenge is pleasant, but it means the challenge isn't about worry, it's about response. So one of the things that we really need to do is check back within ourselves and kind of work out, as Linda was saying, how reasonable are these expectations? And am I experiencing fear because I'm projecting anxiety forward onto something that hasn't happened yet and imagining I won't be able to deal with that situation? This really does us no good and it really doesn't really help us prepare for what's coming. What helps us prepare is for us to be grounded in the moment and to be physically, emotionally, and psychologically ready when that thing comes and to trust ourselves a little bit along the way. Now, some of the things that we're losing in these challenges are things like structure, um, complex interpersonal relationships, you know, seeing different people every day that we're talking to, um, routines, and certain kinds of distractions. Now, when you lose these sorts of things, you kind of get these holes in your diary that you can fill in with uh, catastrophic fantasies of what's going to happen. So, in a sense, we don't want to make more time for these anticipated worries. We really have to start managing our own time much better. How do you... Aaron. Aaron, the connection seems to be a bit funny. I'm getting some feedback. I don't know. Is it a ten? Or that might be better to try now. Enough. We've lost you, sir. If people can bear us with, with for a minute, Aaron, keep trying. How about now? Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How much did you lose? Uh, not that much. Maybe the last minute or so. Okay. Uh, uh, right. So I guess basically I'm saying if if we have these kind of holes in our uh, structures, we're likely to fill those holes with a kind of anxious thinking. So one of the things that we need to do is be much more active about how, create, how we create those structures in our life. In the week, sorry, in the world that we had two weeks ago, we were able to be passive about these sorts of things because our lives structured for us. We had to be at work at a certain time. We had to be home at a certain time. There are all these sorts of things that we needed to do. Now we really need to take responsibility for that ourselves. And we really need to take responsibility, particularly for the things that are missing. Sound okay? Yeah, all good. Keep going. Okay. All right. Okay. What are, what are the things that are missing? Okay. And the thing that's also missing is the passive interpersonal experience that we have every day. And what I mean by passive is, you know, able to, uh, to contact people that you're in contact with, uh, the people in your workspace, the people in the local takeaway, your regular places, regular eye contact, regular touching, these things are missing. So one of the things that I really implore you, if you are a team leader or a manager or a boss or a director in some kind of a way, is that all of these invisible structures that ensured that your team was emotionally and psychologically competent have disappeared. And they are not individually going to be implementing those kind of structures themselves. And it's very hard to implement those structures when you're working online. However, you can a bit more. So I would ask you, how are you running your Zoom meetings, for instance? How are your conversations working across Slack if you use something like that? How are you maintaining communications in your teams? And what we need to be doing is addressing that the nature of our communications have shifted. I think Nick was saying in the very beginning, it's all very well and nice when we have a big speaker event and you can have a warm body on the stage speaking at you and you can shake their hand afterwards and there's this high level, high complexity interaction. That is actually a psychological good to have that high complexity interpersonal reaction. And when we don't have that automatically, we have to make it, which means putting a little bit more effort into it. So can you create some kind of routines for your team? Can you check in on Slack, for example, in the morning, find out how everybody's doing? Can you do, in a sense, without becoming a psychotherapist or a counselor, um, have a little bit of a check-in. So have a, a little 10 minute se section at the beginning of a team Zoom meeting and asking people how they're getting on. Asking people um, if they have concerns about their health or the health of loved ones. You can limit it so it's just a check-in, but in a similar way to what Mark was saying, this is not the in-depth conversation on the side of the bridge, but this is a sign that says, I am listening to you. Yes, we have a task to be done. Yes, we're still in a workplace, but I'm also providing some kind of recognition. 
when you're in the teams, what kind of support can you give to each other? What kind of awareness do you have about each other's families? I mean, I think one of the great opportunities that um, coronavirus brings is suddenly we're in each other's houses all the time as well. So you're having like a Zoom meeting with your boss who maybe you thought was the most conscientious person in the world. And then you just see like behind them, it's like a jumble sale at home. So you kind of get this insight into these people's lives. And uh, a lot of the training that I do around systems and organizations is I kind of destruct this idea of achieving a work-life balance. There is no such thing as a work-life balance because work is life. It's just a particular manifestation of life. And you have to take great care of that manifestation because it's the way people seek recognition, get recognition, have important relationships in their life, get validated, and most importantly, particularly if you're lucky, how you express yourself and people receive that expression in the workplace. So work is a really important aspect of self-actualization. The risk in moving into at-home working and working over Zoom and working over Slack is it starts to be about productivity again or, or, or what's getting done and what are the tasks that need to be done. Let's not forget the really important function here that we're working in a challenging environment that most people at the moment are concerned about their jobs, their health, their loved ones, and the uncertainty that's arising. Without turning it into group therapy, can we create some room within the workspace to recognize the challenges, to incorporate them into the systems that you have, and to be human about this crisis in the way that we are with each other? So just to uh, sum up, um, if you're holding these spaces in the sense of being team leaders, employers, directors, can you better hold these spaces that are emotionally intelligent, psychologically intelligent for your teams? And if you're not holding these spaces, if they're being held for you, what spaces can you hold for yourself in your own personal routines? Can you, for example, do a short breathing exercise like we just practiced uh, between calls? Yeah, you don't need to do a 20 minute meditation session to take a few deep breaths and center yourself so you're not going from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting can you create some space in your life to psychologically and emotionally catch up to yourself, find out where you are, and ideally share that experience with a trusted other so that we can kind of virtually anyway, hold our hands through this crisis, support ourselves through this crisis, and implement the best structures that we can to ensure, again, that we can do it with the minimum amount of worry and anxiety as necessary and be anxious just as much as we need to be. And I shall leave it there. Aaron, thank you so much indeed. Really helpful tips for the workplace. And also thank you so much for dealing with the tech when there was the issue. Uh, I'm going to invite Mark to come join us again um, so we can um, get some questions at you guys and go from there. Please keep bringing those questions in. Hi, hi Mark. Welcome back. Hi. Um, listen, I've, we've, had, we've had one overriding question, which I think applies to both of you in different, potentially in different contexts. But it's that fear from us about how we can address with our friends, colleagues, their mental health situation and how we start that conversation um because for most of us it is something which we shy away from and how you do that kind of and this is what we're getting in loads of questions what's the most natural way to do that and how do you open the conversation up you know in my experience both as a clinician and as a as a friend uh colleague uh who has asked others uh for if they need help and who has wanted to be asked for help um, I find that we're more anxious to ask than they are to tell. Um, very often there's a fear, especially around suicide in particular, and that seems like a very rare occurrence, but it's actually not. It's really very common. Uh, not only the, the tragic event of suicide itself, but uh, suicidality and thoughts of suicide are actually extremely common. Um, so I find, though, that there's a fear that if you ask people if they're having thoughts of suicide or if they're struggling, if they're anxious, if they're depressed, uh, that, they'll, that you'll give them the idea somehow to go out and do it or that you'll trigger it or make it worse for them. And that's not the case. Uh, it's one of the most uh, uh, protective factors uh, in terms of preventing suicide and in terms of getting people connected with the help that they need to just ask the question. Usually I find uh, the least threatening way of doing that, if you're concerned that it, that it might be threatening for somebody, uh, is to make it completely behaviorally based. Looking at changes, uh, if you know something about what their baseline is, that is, 
uh, saying, you seem different, or you don't seem like yourself today, or I've noticed. That's one of the most powerful phrases that I've ever used in both clinical and personal contests, contexts, is that I've noticed that you seem, I've noticed you're having a hard time. Uh, I've noticed that you don't seem like you've been showering or eating, or um, uh, you seem anxious. And we all know what that looks like in, in people's body. So making it very physically uh, oriented and making sure that you're noticing comments are non-judgmental. You're not saying, you're not depressed, are you? Because then you're telegraphing to them right away, don't tell me that you're depressed because you're already imposing a judgment on it. So make sure that you're, that you're asking directly, you're not hedging around it, and that you're framing it as non-judgmentally as possible. Aaron, have you thought so? Yeah, I would, I would just re reflect very similarly, but also add um, naming it naming it just somehow seems to be so helpful for people. And I think um, Mark really named it with, with suicide. People feel that they can't talk about it. Um, this is also the case um, with loss and death when someone's partner dies or a parent dies. It's like people don't know what to say other than I'm sorry for your loss, which they say sort of awkwardly and then kind of shuffle off. And what I would really implore people to do is that this is a, this is a fear problem. And so people are afraid that they'll say the wrong thing. They're afraid that they won't know what to do. And actually, one of the great paradoxes about dealing with fear and anxiety is the key to it isn't to diminish fear and anxiety. The key to it is to expand your capacity to tolerate fear and anxiety. So if you allow yourself to be in that uncomfortable conversation for someone, um, to take the risk and say, um, you know, I've really noticed that you, you, you don't seem to be all right lately. You know, is there something you want to talk about? You may not know what to say. And actually, that's okay, because being able to listen is a really, really good start. And then you can solve that, that problem later. And you could say to that person, I don't know what to say, but I'm really here to listen right now. And maybe we can think together about how we can fix this. It's really overcoming your own anxiety and fear about getting it wrong. And if you can just feel that fear and do it anyway and ask that question and name it, um, you'll be doing yourself a favor and you'll be doing them a favor too. And I think, sorry, Nick, if I could just yes, add, yes. I'll, I'll tack on a little bit here. I, I really love this. I think it's so important because um, I think what underlies the anxiety that helpers or potential helpers often have uh, is this idea that they don't know what to say, that they're not an expert, that they're not a therapist. Well, nobody's asking you to be a therapist or an expert. That's probably not, I mean, that might be what the person needs, uh, but not in that specific circumstance. So by being intentionally authentic, by saying, look, that sounds really tough and I have no idea what to tell you right now. But even just that on its own builds a connection uh, that I think is really helpful. Knowing that you have somebody who is uh, willing to take the brave step to reach out, I think that's really powerful. Thank you. So I, I'm trying to group together questions because obviously there's, there's topics. I think one of the other questions I'm seeing a lot of is um, this world of connectivity in terms of um, social and everything like that and getting the, the amount of information we're getting we're getting into ourselves how best should people be managing that alongside their anxieties and their uncertainty of what's going on is it best to have one trusted source that you go to should you be just trying to get everything in or is it best to stay, stay away from it Aaron do you want to start? Okay, I can yeah, I can I can go with this. I've um, have a lot of experience thinking about particularly social media and uh, in psychology. And the the real quick take home is that what social media does for us, and even a lot of news consumption does for us, is it answers um, it answers a kind of hunger that we have, but in a not very nutritious kind of a way. So our hunger is for sustained, um, complex, good relationships but then we might feed that hunger through Facebook, for example, which is like needing a really fresh salad, but you're eating lots of donuts and hot dogs instead, which can be kind of an immediately pleasurable experience or at least stimulating experience, but it's gonna make you sick in, in the long run. So this is where self-awareness comes on board really importantly. You have to really become aware of what's going on for yourself when you're consuming different sorts of media. And if you find yourself scrolling and it's causing you more anxiety and you're scrolling faster, this is not a good solution, right? So the news outlets, and, and not to demonize social media, I think there's a really good space for it, particularly today, so long as you're using it well. You know, have the odd hot dog, but eat mostly salads in a sense. Um, 
social media and news is built to, in a sense, profit off of our dopamine systems and our reward systems, which kind of knows what we want, but not what we need. So all of your default settings, all of your notification settings, all of that kind of stuff is made for you to consume readily and passively. So the very short answer I have to that is become self-aware, find out what the news in social media is doing to you, and then make some active choices about how you use that so that you don't feel that way about it. Turn off your notifications, check your social media two or three times a day when you decide to take certain apps off your phone if you find that they're causing you some anxiety and limit your news consumption to a minority of trusted sources just a few times a day, I would say. Mark, any thoughts or are you happy with, with Aaron? Yeah, no, I, I think limiting and, and, and knowing your limits are really key here because, you know, something that Aaron said, I think is really important that these services, these platforms are designed to keep you checking them. They're neuro, they're, they've been deeply informed by neurological research uh, to, to support that, to keep you addicted to checking them. And to a certain extent, or to a large extent, actually, from a psychological perspective, what you're probably doing when you're absentmindedly scrolling through Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or one of the other platforms is that you're trying to dissociate. You're either bored or you're anxious, so you're trying to find ways your brain is trying to find ways to distract you. Uh, and that's not always healthy. We know that anxiety propagates itself through avoidance. It just gets worse. Um, so I think that, you know, the, this was most powerfully sent home for me uh, when I wrote the first draft of my book, which will be out later this year. Um, I was so distracted by social media constantly that I literally went to a Trappist monastery in the woods for six weeks. And I lived there with the monks because I had to write this book by my deadline. Otherwise, I was afraid that they would take away my advance and I'd die poor and lonely. That's the anxiety side. So, so I went away to this monastery and it took me a solid four days uh, just to unplug my brain from the city, from the noise, from the, the constant um, tendency to dissociate into social media. So recognize that it might be hard, that you're going to find yourself reaching for your phone a lot, and you need to make that conscious choice. You need to practice and exercise uh, disconnecting, because I think it is in your own uh, interest and in, your, in the interest of your mental health. So, so the other, thank you, I suppose. So the other, the other questions we've got a few of is around the area of uncertainty. And um, there's a comment about how do you deal with the uncertainty, especially with regarding big life changes, such as getting married in this time of where we don't know when it's going to end. How do you contextualize it and bring it back to something which is manageable? Either of you? I, I mean, I would say uh, this kind of comes back to um, learning how to tolerate your feelings better a bit. Mm -hmm. So everybody is scared of change, even if it's positive change. For some reason, it kind of ignites this kind of fear and anxiety in us. And the better we're able to have and endure all of the feelings that we have, the better we're able to be adapted in the world. So if we have a really scary feeling and we don't have to fight the feeling of being completely terrified, we just sit there and we kind of say, okay, in this moment, I'm terrified you begin to learn that it will pass. And you go through a really painful period and then you, you learn that the painful period would pass. So when it comes to uncertainty, and again, I, I really share Mark's idea on this because sometimes, sometimes the things that you say you really mean and they do sound Pollyanna-ish and, and I, I also don't, I don't want it to sound like that. But um, it also sounds like a platitude, which I also hate, but sort of like embracing certain uncertainty is a really important concept to see uh, to see if you can get behind, right? So imagine this situation right now. So much of the population is receiving this experience with, with a great amount of fear, which is completely reasonable. But say you could just step outside yourself a little bit and see yourself experiencing that fear, yeah? So we'd call this kind of a good kind of dissociation. So rather than identifying with being a frightened person, you're kind of as a little piece of you that's saying, oh, this is really scary. But kind of a nice part of yourself saying, oh, this is really scary. And then can you bring a part of yourself to say, and this is a big ask, I do realize this, these are much easier things to do in theory than they are in practice. But can you bring a little part of yourself on board and say, this is gonna be a really curious time. The next three months is gonna be really curious. I, I wonder what that's gonna be like. I'm going to experience fear. I'm going to experience hope. I'm going to experience frustration. I might experience elation. But they're all feelings that you will experience. 
So in psychology, we call this the observing ego. Can we move into an observing ego and actually embrace the uncertainty, not try and control it, not to try and fix it, not try to know what we can't know, but in a sense, ride the wave to its completion, which is fucking scary. And I pardon my language that it really can be fucking scary, but it, it can also be, um, it, it's part of what life is about, uncertainty and change and a lack of control. So that's what life is going to be. Can we embrace that somewhat? Thank you. So I have, I, I'm conscious about time. I have two final questions for you guys. Um, one question, which is accumulation of a few different ones. We've spoken a lot about um, how you can support others and how the business can support you and uncertainty, everything like that. A few questions have been about the fact that how, if you're supporting others and you're taking on their anxieties or their issues, how you can keep a clear head and manage yourself when you're, you're feeling the burden of other people upon you in a good way. I think for me as a person with lived experience uh, working as a clinician, I had to learn this really quickly, really early on, uh, that you, it, you have to be able to help other people because it helps you break out of your own uh, self as well, which I think is good. But uh, if you're going to dip one toe into the water or one foot into the water, you have to keep one foot firmly on the shore. Uh, like they say, in every flight that you ever take, you have to make sure that you fix your own, in, in the event of an emergency, fix your own oxygen mask before you help anybody else. Because if, uh, if you're falling apart, then your skills uh, will not be all that useful. So I think that comes back to everything that we've been talking about with others. You have to walk the walk. If, if you want to help others, you have to help yourself and practice some of the things that we've talked about here today. Uh, practice mindful, uh, mindful awareness. Maintain a present moment awareness non-judgmentally recognize what you're feeling name what you're feeling uh, and be able to process it give yourself space and forgiveness to process what you're feeling uh, rather than just pushing it all down inside we've <laughs> we have known for a very long time that pushing away how we feel doesn't work it will come back uh, later on so if you truly want to help others and I believe that everybody listening to this has loved ones that they want to help uh, make sure that you take good care of yourself too, so that way you can be in great shape to take care of them. Thank you very much indeed. So my, my, my last question, um, and taking it back, I, I, there's a lot of our clients on here who are from the events industry, um, and obviously we put this on for them kind of, for, kind of to learn about mental health and get some tips and tools, as we said at the beginning, but also so they can see about ho hosting a webinar and having amazing speakers um, and we obviously actively encourage them to speak to us in order to chat about what we can be doing together. But I think that kind of in the event industry and also in other industries, there's a great dis dis uh, concern about disconnection, about moving events or business online. Um, from a therapy perspective, kind of how, how have you managed that kind of, and what's the dynamic for you guys and how has that affected your platform of what you do um, and how have you managed that? Um, I, I think what's really important, I can keep this pretty brief, is, is, is what we learned, we've been doing uh, online therapy, I don't know, going on 10 years now or something, video, video conferencing, and we'll, the, the, the main research that's come out is saying that it's, it's not the functional equivalent, is what it's called, it's not the functional equivalent of face-to-face -face therapy. That doesn't mean it's less good, it just means that it's different, right? So lots of therapists that are now moving their practices online who aren't really thinking about what it means to move it online aren't necessarily thinking through how to make the online experience better so while i can't kind of speak it would take way too long to speak to how to do that for events and uh, webinars and that sort of thing i guess that the, the big thing is your online event is not the functional equivalent equivalent of a face-to-face -face event so don't think of it as a replacement think about it as a different kind of event and then think through critically how you can manage that sort of an, an event to use it to take advantage of what it has to offer because they're not just negative consequences so how can we really profit from what that has to offer and then how do we mitigate as much as we possibly can those things that make it more difficult that we don't have in a face-to-face -face encounter and maybe there's a lot to draw on between the research and online therapy and the research and online events that uh, we could probably learn from each other mark any last words 
Yep. Well, Thank I'll you. say, yeah, I'll say that um, certainly EAP uh, employee assistance programs and insurers are moving uh, very heavily into the digital therapy space. Uh, and, and the research on that is mixed. But what there is a good base of research on is uh, breaking down stigma and uh, performing contact based education that we know that that does seem to work reasonably well, if depending on what your goal is, if your goal is to raise mental health awareness to improve help seeking behaviors to reduce stigma in your workplace, uh, then virtual platforms have shown to be really quite effective at doing that. Um, so I think we can do mental health awareness and education uh, effectively by this medium. Uh, and I think we can also do conversations just like this. Uh, I think we all decided here today not to do boring old slides, uh, because when we have observers who are engaging with us in this type of platform, we want to have a conversation. So I think that's the best way you can do this. You can get people to the same learning objectives, just in a different way, uh, through, narr through a narrative approach and through conversation. And, and I think that you can do that uh, a bit more creatively creatively, but you can do that on a virtual platform. So I think there's great opportunity to raise great mental health awareness in this way. Mark, Aaron, and um, Linda, thank you so much indeed for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, and it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you to everyone who for listening and tuning in, and hopefully you got some amazing stuff out of that. Obviously, kind of, it was, it was short and it was concise, but there was so much content in there. It's a fantastic opportunity. Listen, from my perspective, we want there are two purposes of this. Firstly, number one was to give you the content and give you some amazing tips, um, but also to demonstrate to you the power of um, the communication and being able to get together and have that conversation. We are at Speakers Corner here for you guys to be thinking about how the kind of your events and how you can be delivering content to your staff, to your clients, to whoever you feel is necessary. Um, we are here to chat and, and talk about it and work things differently because we are in a different world now. But also from our perspective, we want this series to be yours. So please, please, please feedback um, your feelings about the webinar, feedback about subject matters that you'd like us to be going into. We, are, we want to give content to everyone. Um, please get in contact with us at Speakers Corner on the web, from the website or from the phone or to your account manager. Um, be delighted to talk much, much more to you about Mark, about Aaron, about Linda. Um, or about anyone you would like, um, but we really appreciate your time taking time out of your day to speak to listen to us. Hope you've enjoyed it, um, and have a great rest of the day. And take care. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.